Thank you for the privilege, Lord. Thank you for the strength, the encouragement. Thank you for the ability to get out, out of our beds and be here today. Lord, we want to say we love you. We want to say, God, that you're our God. And Lord, we're glad that you're for us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Wow. I pray and I pray that you would have a wonderful Thanksgiving day. How many of you did? Half of you? How many of you had a wonderful Thanksgiving day? Amen. I'll tell you one thing. Food is great. Family is great. Uh, being together is wonderful. But what said in my heart to remember is to be thankful for the salvation that Jesus came in to offer me and all of you and all of our loved ones. And I was so uh, amazed thinking, thank you, Father, that you sent Jesus. And this was all I could say. Thank you, Father, for Jesus. Thank you, Father, for Jesus. Because without Jesus, I would not have any right to come to your presence. But because of him, I belong to you. And you are my father. And I can call upon you anytime I may need grateful, joyful, when, whatever the situation is. So I am so grateful that God had so much love for us that he gave us a precious Savior that we can then come to Him at any time. And not only do we come to Him, but Jesus is always speaking for you. You know, when we pray, sometimes the Father probably is just listening, and then Jesus will say, Father, I die for her. That's mine. Hear her. Answer her prayer. I believe that with all my heart. The, 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 the Bible says Jesus intercedes for us. To the Father, and He says, "Remember, I die for Him. I die for her. So it's it's, it's only right that you answer her prayer. Isn't that a wonderful uh, to know that we have assurance that God is with us? I am so grateful to the Lord today for all of you. It's always a privilege to come up here and say hi to my precious church family that we pray and love so much. You know, my father, my mother." are in heaven with the Lord, but they received Christ, and for that I would always be thankful to the Lord. They accepted the Lord at a very young age, and because of that I was introduced to the best father and the best treasure of this world. So to God be all the praise and all the glory. I pray for those that are online listening to us, all of you that are here, so good to see you. May God give you this week and a special anointing and touch and thoughts about how grateful we should be, not only this month, but the rest of the year. Amen. God bless the church. As always, love and prayers for you. Amen. Thank you. Well, good to have you in the house of the Lord. Those of you that are online, as my wife said, glad that you're with us today. You know, I want to remind you what Living Word is all about, and I told you I'm going to, I'm going to pound this into you until you memorize it. Living Word is about connecting people to God, each other, the community, and the world. We're about helping people build a relationship with the Lord. That's what it's about. As my wife said, I pray you would have had a wonderful Thanksgiving with family, enjoyed a lot of food, and uh, praise God that we have more than enough. Amen. Also today, if you follow the Jewish calendar, today is Hanukkah. Hanukkah begins today. And if you're wondering what is Hanukkah, Hanukkah is an eight-day Jewish celebration that commemorates the rededication of the temple two centuries before Christ. The second temple, we know that as the second temple. And according to history, the Jews rose up against the, the, the Syrian, Greek Syrian oppressors known as the, Mac, the, the, the revolt of the Maccabeans. And for eight days, they will light a candle and they will remember how God brought them through that period. And of course, we have a lot of brothers that are Messianic Jews that love the Lord and they'll be celebrating that. And we just rejoice with them. Can I hear a good amen to that? Amen. You know, we're in a series of messages entitled, Come to Worship. And today I want to speak to you on the subject of bow, bow your knee, bow before God, bow in your knee before God. You know, uh, when you and I come and we kneel before God, kneeling is an act of surrender, it's an act of worship. You know, I grew up in a church where kneeling was very important. We don't practice kneeling too much anymore in Christian churches. It sort of has become a thing of the past, something that maybe is not important. But what I want to do today is I want to tell you how important that is. I remember I grew up in a church, and uh, when people would come into church, the first thing they would do is that they would kneel and pray. Some of them would come to the front, and they would kneel and pray. Some would go to, a, to their seat, and there at their bench or their chair, they would kneel and pray. 
And uh, it was a, it was a, a sign of, of worship, of, of submission to God as they came into the house of God. I remember when, we need, when I would go up to the pulpit, I was about a 16, 17-year-old boy, and uh, I would go up in a Spanish church and, and just participate, and I would have to kneel before I came up to the pulpit, and then I would have to kneel when I went down before I went to my seat. You know, and I, there was a time where I thought, well, that's all very religious, that's all very ritualistic, but it's not necessary. There was a time I thought that. But I, I want to say to you, I changed my mind. Kneeling before God, not only is it biblical, it's important, and it's necessary. Now, I'm not suggesting that you need to come and kneel every time you come into church or up here. That's not what I'm saying. But just the act of kneeling is very powerful. Over there in the Gospel of Matthew, in chapter 2, in verse 10 and 11, it tells us when the wise men actually experienced Christ for the first time. And notice what it says in verse 10. It says, when they saw the star, they were filled with joy. Now, notice some of your Bible says they were overjoyed. And some of you probably ask yourself, why were they so overjoyed? Well, they were looking forward to the coming of the Messiah. They were looking forward to the, to the Savior. They had been believing and praying. Now, now, some of you say, well, Pastor, I thought that was a, a Jewish thing, a Jewish thing. These guys aren't Jewish. These guys are, are Middle Easterners, probably Persians. Why are they expecting the Messiah? Well, I suggest to you that they were expecting the Messiah because men like Daniel, who were in the Persian Empire, you know, men like men of God that were in the Babylonian Empire, they had shared the prophecies of the Messiah. And there are some people that had embraced it. And some of them were these wise men. Now, I want to get something straight in your mind. These were not astrologers. They were astronomers. There's a big difference. Uh, they're not astrologers. We think of them as psychics, as, you know, uh, occultish. No, these guys were students of the star, and they had heard that uh, the star had appeared, and they wanted to come and find the Savior of the world. Notice what it says in verse 11. It says, they entered the house, and they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down, and they worshipped him. I want you to notice, they bowed down, and they worshipped him. Now, now, most of the time, when we think of the wise men kneeling down to the baby Jesus, uh, we think of a four-day-old four baby, maybe an eight-day baby, maybe two weeks, or, or whatever. Because that's what we see in the major scenes, in the manger scenes. That's what you see on your Christmas cards. And you're going to see a manger scene right now or there in your Christmas cards. That's what we see. We see them, baby Jesus, in the arms of, of, of Mother Mary. But, but I want you to know that in reality, chances are that Jesus was not a baby when the wise men arrived. He was more than likely a toddler, about two years old when the wise men got there. Now, this is not bad teaching. This is truth, and I'm going to show you why. Remember, they, uh, they traveled, uh, these wise men came up from about 900 miles away to get to Jesus the moment they saw the star. And they didn't get there in a day or two or three or four. They probably had an entourage, all right? But this changes the whole dynamics of the story for, for several reasons. Another thing I want to suggest to you is that we don't know there were three wise men. The Bible doesn't say there were only three. We assume there were three because they brought three, there was three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But it's very possible there were, there were more than three, and, and we don't know that for sure. But we do know that Jesus was not a little baby of days, probably two years old. You know, I, I don't know about you, but I, I often think about this. I wonder if Jesus went through the terrible twos. Have you ever thought about that? <laughs> Amen? You know, kids go through the terrible twos. You know, uh, there, there's a picture. You're going to see a, a, a kid, you know, how they act during the terrible twos. You know, before I had kids, I don't know about you, but before I had kids, I used to judge parents with those terrible two kids, amen, until I had one, amen. And my girls were good, but I had a little boy named Vic, and by the way, Vic's not here today, he's preaching at Banning this morning, but Vic, you know, you're going to see a picture of him if you haven't seen it yet, there in that picture, he looks very mild, he looks very, uh, a very sedated little, can I see the picture up there please of Vic? There it is. Thank you. <laughs> he looks very innocent. He's two years old there. But I want you to know, he went through the terrible twos. As a matter of fact, let me go and tell you, he put us through the traumatizing twos. Amen. <laughs> he gave us a run for our money. But before I was a parent, we were parents. We, you know what? I knew everything about parenting. And those of you that aren't parents, you think you know everything about parent. And you would see those wild two-year-olds in, two in the restaurant. And they'll be banging on the table throwing their french fries at everybody, throwing them on the floor, clearing the table. My son used to, we couldn't go to a restaurant because he'd always be tempted to want to do this, just clear the table. 
And then when you would tell him something, he would slap you. Now, I, I, come on, say amen. I know we think that's cute. We think that's funny, but it's not cute, and it's not funny. All right? And he would laugh, and, and you know, you just want to, don't want to say it, but you want to punch him. Amen, right? Yeah. I, I remember when I was, I didn't have kids, I would say, man, when I become a parent, there's no way my kid's going to act that way. Why, I knew it all. But when, I had, when we had our own, everything changed. And you would try everything. And I remember I finally, we, we finally figured out I can't be spanking him all the time. You know what? Because that's not going to work. So after a while, you're just doing whatever they want. They want to run, let them run. They want to throw the fries at you, let them throw them at you, you know. Because otherwise, there's going to be a, a big old episode, right? A big old drama. Now, I tell you all of that to say that when the wise men arrived to see Jesus, I, I don't know if he went through the terrible twos or not, but he wasn't a baby. He was a toddler. And they're bowing down to a two-year-old toddler. Now notice, I'm going to prove this to you. Look at what it says in verse 7 of that same chapter. It says, Then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men. And he learned from them the time when the star first appeared. And then he told them, Go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. Now, of course, Herod doesn't want to go worship him. He wants to kill him, right? Verse 16, jump down to verse 16. Herod was furious when he realized that the wise men had outwitted him because they didn't come back. The Lord told him, don't go back, go another way, go home back another way. He sent soldiers, notice this part, to kill all the boys in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under based on the wise men's report of the star's first appearance. So in other words, Herod says, listen, you know what? Soldiers go into that town, go into that little region and kill all of them to and under. That way he doesn't escape. Because he believed Jesus would have been at least two years old or maybe a little bit younger. That's why we tell you he wasn't a three, four, five-day-year-old little baby. Now, I, I want to talk to you today, though, on the subject of kneeling in the presence of God, bowing before God. You know, I, I've been talking to you about lifting our hands to God. That's biblical. I've been talking to you about pouring our, house, our hearts out to God. I know that that pushes us out of our comfort zone, but it's biblical. But, but I want you to also know that bowing before the Lord is biblical. You know, it's hard for some of us to imagine that I would ever bow before the Lord or kneel before the Lord. Especially guys. You know, guys only kneel, two, they only kneel twice in all of their life. Guys. Number one is when you're proposing to your girlfriend, right? You kneel. Well, most of you guys kneeled. Some of you didn't. But most. That's when I kneel. And the second time you kneel is when you're taking those sports pictures and you get the helmet, the ball, and you kneel down, right? Only two times. You know, culturally speaking, most of us don't go around kneeling. We don't like the idea of kneeling. That's not going to happen. And yet in God's Word, you're going to see over and over again opportunities and instruction to kneel in humble submission you know what? As we recognize God, how awesome he is, it's a biblical thing. And over and over in the Bible, you're going to read this. Look at Psalm 95, verse 6 and 7 to give you an example. It says, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker, for he is our God. We are the people. He watches over the flock under his care. If only you would listen to his voice today. You know, there's an interesting word. The, interesting, the, the word in Hebrew actually translated worship. One of the words that's, there are many, translated worship is the, the Hebrew word shaha. And the word shaha is used over 170 times in the Old Testament, and it literally means to bow down. It doesn't just mean to bow down or kneel down. It actually literally means to prostrate yourself, head down all the way to the ground as you go before God. Now, it's interesting that even though the Bible talks about kneeling before God, it never commands it. It assumes that if you are a follower of God, that you will, you will bow down, you will worship him with, with, in any way possible. The Bible does say that we are not to bow before false idols, nor any other gods. The only one we bow down to is the Lord, and yet the Lord never says you have to. He assumes we will. He assumes we would want to. That's why David writes, come, let us bow down and worship before our God. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker. And what I want to try to do today is I want to try to change your, your way of thinking. I want to inspire you. I want to encourage you. That, you know, as you worship the Lord, that you would not just do it, when, you know, by, by singing and clapping, which is good, but that you would raise your hands, you would pour out your heart to God, and you would kneel before the Lord. And you would do it not just here, but you would do it everywhere, in your home, every opportunity you have. 
You know, the Muslims, they, they pray five times a day. It doesn't matter where they're at. You know, the Jewish people, it doesn't matter. We're on the plane flying to Israel, and it's time to pray, and they go to a corner, they pull out the little, you know, all their gear for prayer, and they pray. And you know what? They're not embarrassed. There's no awareness. What are people going to think? And then they get, they pull out their Torah, their Bible, and they go to a corner, you know what, usually by the exit sign, and I'm thinking, man, I hope that door doesn't open, because he's going to be the first one to fly out of there. And they're, they're bowing before the Lord, you know, they go down. And, and, and that's amazing. Christians are the only ones that have stopped kneeling before the Lord. We're the only ones that think it's a cultural thing, it's outdated, it's not for today. There's no way I would ever do that. And yet the Bible says we should. And there are some particular times that we should bow before the Lord. So let me give you three reasons, different reasons, why you might want to bow. Why a time that it is appropriate to bow. And here's number one. You might want to kneel before God as you pursue Him, as you seek Him. You know what? In other words, as you draw near to Him. One of the great ways we can draw near to God is kneeling before the Lord. Over there in the Gospel of Mark in chapter 10, there's an interesting story about a rich young man that comes to the Lord. He's a ruler. You know, a guy that had everything he ever wanted, everything, everything he thought he would need, that you and I would think he would need, and yet he knew something was missing. He knew something was wrong. He knew, and by the way, you're going to learn that also. If you, put, if you think that in getting more stuff and having everything you want, that's going to make you happy, that's going to make you fulfilled and satisfied, you're going to learn that that's not the case. Not only did he understand this, but we're living in days where a lot of people have a lot of everything and more of what they need, and yet they're still empty. Yet they're still drinking themselves to sleep. Yet they're still out, you know what, and, and looking and searching. Well, this is the guy. That's the condition of this guy. And in verse 17 of Mark 10, it says, And as Jesus was starting out on his way to Jerusalem, a man came running up to him, and he knelt down. And he asked, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? You know, I probably have preached on this scripture 20 times or so in my 40 years of being a pastor. And I, I've always had focus on the, the part that says, Master, what must I do to inherit, you know what, eternal life? I've always focused on that. I have never really paid attention to what the young man does when he comes and he bows down before the Lord. He comes down and he humbles himself and he kneels because he understood what kneeling meant. And he says, Lord, I, I, I'm empty. I'm, I'm tired. I'm, you know what, I, I'm looking for answers. I'm looking for meaning. I'm looking for purpose in life. And you know what, and, and everything I've done, I thought I would have it, but I don't have it. And, and he comes, he says, what do I have to do? You know, some of you right now, you're at a place like that in your life. You know what, you're, you've thought that everything, you would find everything you wanted and all the things, and you've done them, and yet there's emptiness. And you know why? Because you're not a committed follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, there's a lot of people that believe in God, but they're not pursuing God. They're not drawing near to God. There's a lot of people that say, you know, I know he's real, but they're not. They're not really interested in following him. You know what? Yes, he is. Amen. <laughs> in other words, you're not a devout follower. You know what I call Christians like that? I call them casual Christians. You know what a casual Christian is? It's like a, a casual boyfriend. You know what a casual boyfriend is? It's a guy who just calls you and looks you up when he's lonely, when he needs companionship. Otherwise, doesn't look you up. And some people are, are happy with that. And there's a lot of Christians that have a casual relationship with God just when they need Him, when they're hurting. Lord, help me! And you know what's so good about God? He always comes through. But listen, if you're here and you, you have not been pursuing God with all of your heart and you're just casual, you know, you, you need to at some point kneel before God and say, Lord, I want to draw near to you. I want to seek you. You know, seeking God. Because here's what happens. God's not going to force himself upon you. You know, as you kneel, you're taking the first step and God says, as you draw near, I will draw near. You know what? As you raise your hand, you're drawing near, I will draw near. You know, some of you are, are here and say, well, I don't know if that will work. Well, how would you know if you never tried it? How would you know if you never do it? So I, I want to suggest to you a time to kneel before God is when we're pursuing God, when we're drawing near to God. And, and when you do that, you need to pray and say, God, if you're really there, show me. If it's really you, reveal yourself to me. I remember that night I gave my life to Christ and, you know, I, I knelt. And by the way, I knelt because the guy said, you need to kneel. I didn't want to kneel, but my grandma was there. She made me kneel. And I can remember once I knelt, I'll tell you, the moment my knees hit the ground, a miracle happened in my life. I'm telling you, it was a miracle. And I, I, God showed me and I... I started crying. I gave my life to the Lord. 
And I told him, I remember, I told the Lord, Lord, I, I've grown up in church. I've heard all these stories. I've heard you say, but I heard you're real. And maybe this is it. And if it is, if it, is it, reveal yourself. You know what, help me, because this is, you know, Christianity that I know, it's too hard because the Christianity I worked, I, I grew up in, you couldn't watch TV, you couldn't go to dances, you couldn't, you couldn't do anything. They were the most boringest people in the world. And I said, why in the world would anyone want to be a Christian? Now I've learned that they were wrong. It's fun being a Christian. Yeah, you can have fun, you can enjoy it. But I told him, Lord, you're going to have to help me. And I'll tell you, he did. And I want to warn you, and I just want you to know, the moment you get on your knees and you pray something like that, get ready, because God shows up. Amen. He shows up. He's going to draw near to you, because God draws near to us. And I can remember going to school. I was a junior in high school. And you know what? Just God. God was speaking to my heart. And I told you, I cried. I'm crying. And I want to be in church. And I want to kneel. I, you know, I never knelt by, besides my bed at night. I'm kneeling at my bed. No one told me, you have to kneel now. It was just instinctive, you know, honoring God. So kneeling in, you know what, as you draw near to God, think about that, do it. And here's another time you might want to kneel. You know what, when you need to repent before God, you need to repent. Because you know every once in a while, sometimes we do things that really are wrong. Not only are they wrong, the Bible calls them a sin. And not only are they a sin, they break the heart of God, but they hurt you. And they hurt the people around you. You know, when you go out and you sin against God or against somebody, the Bible says that the answer to that is to repent. you got to repent. You know what? Some of you right now, you might be smiling on the outside, but on the inside, you're grieving because you're hurting. And you're a Christian, and the reason you're hurting is because you're grieving the Holy Spirit by your lifestyle. You know what? You've hurt people, and you know it. And there's something in you that just doesn't want you to acknowledge it and recognize it. You know what, even, the, even though the Spirit of God is telling you, you need to repent, you're like, no, I'm not going to repent. And yet the Bible says that we must repent because we do fail. Now, I run into Christians every once in a while who will tell me, well, now that I'm a Christian, I don't have to repent because I don't sin anymore. And I say, well, listen, I want to hang around you because I want to see you're so holy, you're ready to go to heaven. I want to see you ascend into heaven. Amen. I think that would be amazing. Or why don't you come to my pool? I want to see if you can walk on water like Jesus. Amen. Let's see how holy you are. But we do sin every single day. We fall short. I fall short. Now, I don't want you to leave here thinking, I wonder what pastor's doing. Amen. That he's talking, he's confessing to us. No, no. Just sometimes your thoughts, sometimes your words, sometimes your actions. But the Bible has a lot to say about repentance. The word repentance in the Bible literally means the act of changing your mind. That's what it means. So repentance isn't remorse, it isn't regret, it isn't feeling bad about stuff that I've done. It's more than that. It's more than just acknowledging it. I'll tell you what Erdman's Bible Dictionary says. It says, in its fullest sense, repentance is a term for a complete change of orientation involving a judgment upon the past and a deliberate redirection for the future. You know, in the Old Testament, the Old Testament, the message of the prophets, a lot to the people of Israel, was to repent. And when the Bible, when they would talk to the people of Israel about repentance, it involved not only a commitment, you know what, to recognize your wrong, to change your mind, but a new, renewed sense of the relationship with God. A new sense of walking in obedience to His Word. This idea of honoring God, living right, transformation, being the people of God. Yet, oftentimes, when we think of repentance, we think only about remorse, you know, and I feel bad. And the reason we have remorse and we feel bad is because we got caught and we don't want to face the consequences of our sin, but that's not repentance. That's not real repentance. You know, you can go out and mess up and feel bad. That doesn't mean you have repented. And that would happen a lot to the people of Israel. And the prophets would come and they would call the nation of Israel. They would call individuals back to God and repent and surrender their lives. Turn away from uh, the life that, that lived, that you lived, ruled by sin. You know what? To a relationship with God. Let him be your ruler. Let him be your God. Let him be the master of your life. And in the New Testament, there are several Greek words, many Greek words in the New Testament that help us understand the full meaning of repentance in the Bible. The first Greek word is the Greek word metamelimai. metamelimai. That's the Greek word. And it means a change of mind. That's what it means. And, and, and it usually, metamelemai, usually produces regret. It produces remorse for what you've done wrong. But it doesn't necessarily 
mean a change of heart or a change of, of, of your direction. By the way, the word is used several times in the New Testament, and I want to show you where it's used. Matthew 27, as it describes what Judas felt after he betrayed the Lord. He felt metamelimai. He felt remorse. Some of your Bibles translate that repentance, and, and so people ask, hey, well, since he repented, will he be in heaven? Well, first of all, you and I, none of us can judge who's in heaven, who is not. But the idea is that he never repented, never did. Look at what it says in Matthew 27, verse 3. It says, when Judas, who had betrayed him, realized that, that Jesus had been condemned to die, he was filled with remorse. So he took the 30 pieces of silver back to the leading priest and the elders. In other words, he felt so bad, wanted to bring the money back. And instead of going, searching out the other apostles, you know what he went to do? He went and he hung himself. You know why he went and he hung himself? Because he never really repented in the sense of changing his mind. And he probably thought he would never be forgiven. But there is this idea that confuses us that, well, if I just feel bad, I have repented. No, you haven't. The other word, there's another word, metanoia, in the Greek, and it actually means to change one's mind and purpose as a result of, of after knowledge. In other words, it's not only feeling bad, recognizing you're bad, changing your mind about what you did, but turning away and living contrary to what you've been doing. That's the idea. You know, true biblical repentance is always characterized by four things. And I want to share them with you real quick. I, I don't have time to go in detail, but I, 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 give you the, I give you the scriptures in your notes. You can go and follow them. But number one, true repentance involves a sense of awareness of one's own guilt, sin, sinfulness, and helplessness. In other words, true repentance is where you're aware of, I've done something wrong. I'm sinful. And there's nothing I can do about it on my own strength. The second thing, true repentance, it takes hold of God's mercy through Jesus Christ. Repentance says, I've, I've done wrong, I want to change, but I don't have the power, I need help, and you recognize the only help available to me is God's help. It's not self-will, it's Holy Ghost power, amen. That's what it means. The third thing that repentance, true repentance means, is a change of attitude and action regarding sin. In other words, I don't want to do that anymore. I want to get away from that. In other words, I want to turn. The repentant person turns away from his or her sins. You know, so if you're a liar and you repent, you don't go back the next day and lie again. You stop lying. You say, Lord, I don't want to lie. I'm a liar. I've tried. I need your help. And as God helps you, you stay away from lying. Well, pastor, what about white little lies? Even white little lies. Amen. You stop lying. Number four, the fourth thing is true repentance results in a radical and a persistent pursuit of, the, of, of God, of holy living, walking with God in obedience to his commandments. In other words, after true repentance, you recognize it, you know it's wrong, you want to turn, I can't do it on my own, I need help, I'm going to move in the direction of what's right, and I want to honor God with my life. I want to be obedient to his word. Now, honestly, I struggle with Christians that say they love the Lord, but their lifestyle doesn't reflect God at all. As a matter of fact, in some cases, it's worse than the lifestyle of a non-Christian. I have a very difficult time with that. I'm not judging them. I'm not going to tell you they're not Christians, but I do tell you there's a little red flag in me that says something's wrong there because that's not true Christianity. That's not true repentance. Because, you know, during his ministry, the whole mission of the Lord Jesus Christ was to call people to repentance. Luke 5.32 says, this is Jesus, I come to call not those who think they're righteous, but those who know they're sinners and need to repent. In his farewell address to the disciples, Luke tells us in Luke 24, in verse 47, prior to his ascension, he said these words, it was also written that this message would be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all nations. Beginning in Jerusalem, there is forgiveness of sin for all who repent. In other words, in the Bible, when the Bible talks about repentance, it involves this complete awareness, this irreversible change of mind, of heart. It affects your actions. It affects your, your spirit, your soul. It affects your, your everything and the way you live. Because sin is offensive to God. That's why we, we are to repent. Over there, there's a, there's a powerful example of, of kneeling in repentance by Peter. In the Gospel of Luke, chapter 5, Peter was a fisherman. You know, that's what he did. And the Bible tells us that he's fishing all day and he hadn't caught anything. And Jesus will come up and he will say, hey, why don't you throw your nets on the other side of the boat? Now, you got to put yourself in Peter's shoes. Peter's a fisherman. You know what? He's been fishing all night. 
The boats were seven, eight feet wide, about 12, 14 feet long. You know, if I'm Peter, I'm thinking, you know, I've been fishing all night. I'm a fisherman by profession. Don't tell me how to do my job. I know what I'm doing. You know, and, and if you're a carpenter, you, you build the table. I'll put the fish on the table. You just take care of your business. I'll take care of my business. That's what I would be thinking, all right? But, but, but the guy tells him, and by the way, he doesn't know it's Jesus. But, but the guy says, well, why don't you just throw him on the other side? And he does. I'll do it because you say, I mean, what is it going to hurt? And all of a sudden, you know what? There's so many fish, the net's breaking. He can't bring it in by himself. And when he realizes who is the one that told him to cast his nets, notice his response in verse 8. When Simon Peter realized what had happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus. Notice, why? As an act of repentance. Man, I was so wrong. My thinking was crazy. And he said, oh Lord, please leave me. I'm such a sinful man. That's an act of repentance. Now here's the beautiful thing. Jesus never, you know, if I would have been Jesus, I would have been upset at him. I would have said, you know what, you knucklehead, you talk before you think, you put your foot in your mouth, you've done that since day one that I met you, when are you going to learn? Come on, get it together, Peter. He never does that. And by the way, he will never do that with you. Jesus never turns away a sinner with a repentant heart. You know, some of you are here in church today, and you're surprised you're in church. Somebody invited you. And you haven't been wanting to come to church because you're thinking, listen, if I go to church, it's gonna, the roof is going to cave in, it's going to fall on us. You know what, lightning's going to hit me. If I sing a song, if I start singing, man, it's, you know what? And some of you think, well, people are going to know me, and they're going to know I'm not a religious person. And you're going to feel uncomfortable, and they're going to feel uncomfortable. And that's what you think. You know why you think that? Because that's what the devil wants you to think. You know what? God is glad you're here. We're glad you're here. Amen. People aren't going to judge you, and if they do, they're wrong. Here's what I'm telling you. It doesn't matter how bad you are. You belong in the presence of God. And the Lord never turns away anyone who comes with a repentant heart. The Bible says, God, God inclines this year. God loves when we humble ourselves. And there's no better way to humble in repentance than coming and kneeling before, the God, before God. So, so here we see Peter kneeling in repentance. And there will be some of you that that's what you're going to need to do. Kneel down and say, Lord, I've sinned against you. Lord, I need you to forgive me. And, and you're going to kneel down and you're going to say, Lord, help me, Lord. Because here's what the Bible says in 1 John 1, 9. It says, when you confess your sins, our God is faithful and just to forgive you of all your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Everything that's been wrong. Do you know, listen, when you humble yourself before God and you come clean and you're transparent, you know, Lord, I've done something wrong, forgive me. In that moment, you're going to experience the grace of God. In that moment, you're going to sense an overwhelming release of the guilt and the shame because that's the way God is. And, and you know what's going to happen? You've now to, to repent, but you're going to want to stay there and draw near to him and say, Lord, thank you. You know what? Because God freely forgives. You don't earn it. You can't deserve it. Some of you, you know what? You're going to want to kneel in, as you pursue God, as you draw near to God. Some of you are going to want to kneel in repentance as you talk to God from the bottom of your heart. And there's no better way than getting on your knees, on your face. A pastor, do I have to do that in church? I don't know, do you? At least in your home, at least somewhere. You know, every once in a while, I'll come in during the day and I'm kneel. And I talk to the Lord and, and I tell him, Lord, I come to kneel. I could sit down and people say, well, we can sit down. I can say, absolutely, you can, no doubt about it. But when we kneel, we are, we are communicating something to ourselves and to God, Lord, you are way above me. Lord, I need you and I can't do it without you. That's why we kneel. The third time you might want to kneel is in submission to God, when you're going to submit to the Lord. You know what? Many times submission is very hard to us because we don't want to let go. We want to be in control. You're going to kneel in submission, and you're going to have to tap out. Amen. How many of you watch the UFC fighters? Amen. I'm not a UFC fighter. It's too gory. I don't like that. But every once in a while, I do know some of the rules. You know what? When the guy's beating you, you have to tap out. Amen. Pop, pop, pop. But some of these guys are so proud. They'll break their legs. They'll break their arms. They won't tap out. And you know why they don't tap out? They don't want to give up. They're too proudful. And I think sometimes we're so proudful that we don't want to kneel in submission and say, Lord, forgive me. I'm not in control. You're in control. I believe there are some areas in our lives, probably some areas in your life, where God has been speaking to you about, and you know what? You won't tap out. You know why? I want it my way. I want it this way. 
Listen, God has been reaching out to you for years, and you haven't tapped out. You haven't surrendered. You haven't understood God has a better plan for you than you have for yourself. Some of you, you need to tap out. Can I hear a good amen? Kneel and surrender before God. By the way, do you know Jesus did that? Now, before you judge me and before you think, oh, what is he going to say? Jesus did that. You know, we often don't see it this way, but Jesus, who was born of a virgin there in the manger, you know, was born to save the world, was born to die on the cross for all our sins, God in human flesh, but he knew all that was going to happen. And as the time got closer to the crucifixion, he knew what awaited him. He knew, he knew there would be agony, there would be pain. He knew there would be suffering as he took your wrath and my wrath, our punishment on the cross. So Luke tells us in Luke 22, 41, 42, notice, he walked away about a stone's throne. By the way, they're at the garden. He knelt down and he prayed. Notice he's with his disciples, stone's throws, not that far, wanted to be alone. He knelt down and he prayed. And you say, well, what did he pray? He prayed a prayer of surrender. Verse 42, Father, if you are willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Not my will, but your will. And some of you, that's what you need to pray. Tap out and say, Lord, it's been my will. It's been what I wanted. Lord, I've done my, th I, my, my thing. And Lord, it's been a bad thing. and It hasn't worked out. But now I want your will. I surrender. You know, sometimes you look at people and you say, they seem so strong. You know, they seem to have it together. Sometimes you see Christians and you ask them, how do you do it? Well, I'll tell you what I suspect happens with people that are strong. They're kneeling before God in submission and in surrender. And I'll tell you, when you kneel before God, it gives you the strength to stand, regardless of what life throws your way. Kneeling makes you strong to stand before God. Listen, it's time not only to lift up holy hands before the Lord. It's time not only to cry out to God, you know, uh, from our heart, but it's time... I want to suggest to kneel before God and make it part of your practice. The Bible says you can kneel now or you can kneel later. Do you know that the Bible says that eventually, ultimately, everybody will kneel before God? Right now, it is your choice. God's not going to force it. The Bible says you can confess Him right now that He is the Savior of the world, that He died for your sins. But one day, everybody's going to do it. I, rather, I did it now. You know what? Because one day you will. And, and, and the day you do it, people that don't accept Christ, one day they will kneel and they will confess the Lord, but it will be too late. The opportunity has passed. Look at what it says in Philippians 2, 7 through 11. It says, when he appears in human form, when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and he died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The Bible says one day you and I will stand before God and you will kneel. You will recognize who you're standing before. I want to give you a chance to bow down and recognize it now. I want to give you a chance to confess now. I want to give you a chance to bow before God as you pursue Him, as you repent, as you surrender, as you say, Lord, not my will, but your will, now that you have the opportunity. And by the way, you will always have that opportunity as long as you have breath. As long as you're alive. It doesn't matter where you're at, what's going, what you're going through. You can go to God and say, Lord, I surrender. Now, here's what people tell me, and I'm going to end with this. People say, well, I'll do it when I'm at my, dying, when I'm at my, my bed, my deathbed. You see, you're assuming... You're going to be at a deathbed and you're going to have time. What happens if you die in an accident and you had no time? What happens if a plane falls in your neighborhood and you have no chance? What if a tree falls and you're in the living room watching the game and you have no chance to cry out to God? I agree. On your dying bed, you can cry out to God and He will hear you. But what if you don't have that opportunity? What if you get in your car today and you leave and some drunk driver hits you, kills you instantly. There is no second, op there is no opportunity. Right now while you can, kneel before the Lord. Tell the Lord, Lord, I need you. Can I hear a good amen to that? Amen. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes as every head is bowed? Father, we thank you so much for who you are and for what you, you did for us and you're doing for us all these years. 
You know, it's interesting, Lord, to see that the wise men anticipated the birth of the Messiah. The Jewish people did. And Father, we now look back and we celebrate that Jesus is your son, died on the cross for us. And Lord, what that means, it means forgiveness, it means eternal life. And Father God, we thank you that, that you give us the chance, Lord, to draw near to you, to bow down and worship you. And Father God, during this holiday season, we, we want to take time to recognize the amazing truth of grace, the grace that you've had for us. Lord, that you loved us so much that you sent your son, born of a virgin, to die so that we could live. And God, because of that, we worship you. As everyone is prayed and every eye is closed, you know, some of you right now are recognizing that honestly you haven't ever knelt before God. You haven't been pursuing him. You haven't repented. You haven't surrendered to him. And I believe that this morning, the Holy Spirit is speaking to your life and telling you, when are you going to do that? When are you going to stop taking control? When are you going to realize that you're not in control anyway? When are you going to tap out and surrender and say, God, I'm letting it go today. I want your will. I don't want my will. I want to trust you. I've been trusting myself too long, and it's taken me nowhere. It just made things worse. Today, God is talking to you. Today, God is reaching out to you. So, God, we thank you in this holy moment that you're doing a wonderful work in the hearts of people. We don't see it, but, Lord, your word says that that's what you do. So I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would just have your way. There would be less of us, God, and more of you. And, Father, that you would give us the ability to, to do what your word says. Do it in our hearts. Do it, Lord, as a demonstration of our love. We kneel before you and surrender, saying, God, we want you. We want what you want. Father, I pray that we would do that. And Father, during this time, we recognize, Lord, that sin might be separating us from you. and We haven't cleared it. We haven't repented. We won't experience forgiveness. We won't experience a release of guilt and shame until we do that. So Father, I do that right now. Forgive me of my sins. Lord, whether it was in my words, whether it was in my actions, sometimes even in my thoughts, Lord, I bring it to the feet of the cross that your blood would wash me as white as snow. Is everyone still praying, head every bow? Some of you, you know, you're still the Lord of your life. You're doing life your way. And God's been dealing with you. And I think he's dealing with you this morning. Give Christ your life. We cannot force it. We will never force it. God will never force it. But he says that you pursue him. As you take the first step, he'll meet you. But pastor, I don't understand. I know, neither did I. But as I took one step, he met me and I understood. Then I took the next step and the next step. I repented of my sins. I gave him my life. I called upon the Lord. And for 48 years, God has been faithful to work in my life and he'll work in your life. It's been 48 years ago that I gave him my life. He gave me a new life so that I could live for him. So right now, right where you're at, would you lift your hands right now before God? And would you just tell him, Lord, I surrender my life to you. Lord, I need you. God, I've been trying and failing. I need your help today. And Lord, I raise my hands in honor, Lord, to you, in submission to you. I, Lord, first chance I get, I'm going to kneel to you, Lord, also. Thank you for new life, Lord. Thank you, Father, that, that I don't have to face life alone. I'm not alone. Thank you, Lord, that you got me in your hands. That, Lord, you got me on your, on your, on, on your sights, Lord. And I've been running away. I come to you today in Jesus' name. It, with every head still bowed, you're here and you say, Pastor, can you pray for me? Before you leave, I do want to pray for some of you. And uh, all you need to do is stand. And by standing, you are saying, I need God. I need God's help. I need prayer. You know, it's very possible that today God has been speaking to your heart. And you know it. And maybe in the past, he's been speaking to you and you walk out and you leave. And you just think, wow, God spoke to me. But you know, you never acted on it. And by standing, you are acting on it. You are telling God, I hear you. I sense you. I know it's for me what was said today. I, wanna, I want you to know I open my heart. I need you, Lord. Whatever it is, right where you're at, stand up. Don't be embarrassed. We're not going to embarrass you. God's not going to embarrass you. He wants to work in your life. He wants to do a wonderful work. You know, what's hard for you is not hard for God. You know what, what you're facing and thinking, I wonder if there's any hope. There is hope. God is our hope. I wonder if anything can be done about this. Yes, God can do it. He's a miracle worker. And he's a way maker where there is no way. He makes a way. 
That's my God. That's who I serve. That's who I have experienced for 48 years. And I love it. And I want you to know he loves you. Father, you've seen those that have stand, stood. Lord, and by standing, God, they are making a statement to themselves, to you. Father, that they're sincere, they're honest. You know, it's easy for us, Lord, to, they're in the, in the quietness of our, our own space, and you honor that too. But there's something miraculous that happens when we take a step forward. And Father, they've taken a step forward. I don't know what it is. Lord, if they're sick, let your healing power come upon them. And Lord, if there's issues in their relationships, God, bring restoration, Lord, and reconciliation to their relationships. God, if there is emptiness, if there is a void in their heart, Lord, for whatever reason, fill it with your presence, God, because only you can feel it. So, Father, I thank you. I praise you today because you love us and you answer prayers. In Jesus' name, and God's people said, amen. amen. Would the rest of you stand? Give the Lord a hand clap as you stand, please. So let me send you off with a blessing, and my desire is that the Lord would bless you and keep you. Yes. The Lord would make his face shine upon you. The Lord give you his peace and just pour out his favor upon you. I pray that you would leave today and you would understand maybe something you did not understand prior to this month. It's okay to lift holy hands to God. It's okay to cry out from the depths of our heart. It's okay to kneel and bow before the Lord. It honors God. It's ways that we worship God. And they're not old-fashioned and they're not Old Testament. And it wasn't relegated just to the New Testament people. It is for us also. Can I hear a good amen to that? Amen. God bless you. Enjoy the rest of your day. And Lord willing, we'll see you on Wednesday at 7.15 in person or online. Have a great day. God bless you. Amen. <laughs>